Last week, we discussed how state leaders and those in the ethanol industry were reacting to the latest renewable fuel volumes proposal given by EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler. Now, to many directly involved and invested in the state's ethanol industry, it seems the proposed production increase wasn't enough to offset much of the damage done by RFS waivers or small refinery exemptions. And yet again, it seems as though ethanol producers are fighting an uphill battle. Here's Market Journal's Bill Dodd with more. Thanks, Troy. Now, the big concern for those opposed to such heavy-handed uses of the RFS waivers is the fact that many of the smaller refineries are subsidiaries of larger multinational oil conglomerates. In other words, a good share of the refineries that are being granted waivers from blending ethanol into their fuel are still under the umbrella of a larger corporation. Meanwhile, it's recently been reported that ethanol plants around the country will be planning on cutting output due to poor margins and oversupply. Recently, margins to produce ethanol in the Corn Belt have tumbled to a four-year seasonal low, while inventories are at the highest seasonally since 2010. The biggest issue, as we mentioned last week, is the fact that 2.6 billion gallons of production have been lost from 2017 to the present date due to these waivers or small refinery exemptions, and the renewable fuel volume proposal does not take that into account. Now, to put that in perspective, the potential corn demand lost from these exemptions would calculate to around 900 million bushels of corn, according to the Iowa Corn Growers Association. Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts also came out on the offensive, stating, This proposal does not reflect the agency's legal duty to enforce a robust RFS or the President's commitment to our farmers. Nebraska Ethanol Board Administrator Roger Berry explained to me how the agency is failing to meet its legal obligation to the ethanol industry. In 2017, a federal court told the EPA that they needed to make up for a 2016 um, uh, area where they shorted the ethanol industry 500 million gallons. EPA this year in the renewable volume obligations has flat out refused to add that 500 million get back in. So actually the, the uh, conventional ethanol of the renewable volume obligation should be 15 and a half billion gallons, not just the 15 billion gallons. But then you'll have people say, well statutorily we can't go over 15 billion gallons. Well statutorily we should be at a total of 30 billion gallons. 2.6 billion gallons have been lost in 17 for 2017 and 2018 for the waivers that have been approved by the EPA up to this point. 2.6 billion gallons. That's a lot of ethanol when you figure that we produce on, on corn ethanol uh, pretty close to that 15 billion gallons every year. So that's a huge percentage out of that. So that's a big loss to the economy of the state of Nebraska. It's a big loss to our ethanol producers and the hardworking employees at those ethanol plants. And it's also a big loss to our farmers and ranchers across this entire state who deserve better and who have a, are able to make a product that is so much better for the consumer, so much better for the air that we breathe, so much better for their car. But yet it continues to be blocked and run into the ground in any way possible by the big oil companies. Uh, don't get me wrong, I, I paint it as, as we're enemies of oil. We're not. We need each other. We absolutely need each other. And uh, it is, so I don't want it to sound like we hate oil because we don't. We need oil and want to work with them. Now without the oil industry, ethanol would have nothing to blend their product with, so why should oil conglomerates embrace ethanol? Well, it boils down to two words, finite resources. Now we all know oil is a non-renewable source of energy. On World Energy Day in 2014, BP made a startling claim that based on reserve estimates of 1.68 trillion barrels, BP claimed the Earth has enough oil left for about the next 53 years. However, those figures are based on proved reserves, and in reality, we may have several times that amount left. But for argument's sake, let's say we have enough for 300 years. If we were to blend 30% ethanol into our fuel supply, that could help extend the life of a very valuable resource, as well as the longevity of the oil conglomerates for nearly a century longer. In short, the ethanol industry could serve as a crutch of sorts for aging oil companies while they help pave the way for energy sources of the future and secure their place among them. So with year-round sales of E15 coming on and ethanol production down, how much impact will that have on the industry and how can it begin to see an uptick in the profit department? Roger tells me that profits in production will see an upswing in the limited use of waived gallons by the EPA and a healthy dose of consumer confidence. The best thing would be for consumers to start using more ethanol. 
If you have the opportunity to fill up with E15, go in and fill it up because every gallon produced helps out our, our producers, our ethanol producers, and our farmers across the state. The next best thing that could happen is, is that those uh, small refinery exemptions, the ones that are lined up, the 38 that are waiting for uh, EPA to approve for the 2019 year, uh, that they be uh, disapproved. That would be the best thing that could happen. Another area of concern is the current trade situation with China. As tariffs have been increasingly imposed by the current administration, imports of American ethanol have dropped to practically nothing. And that's a big hit for the industry, and with China set to implement a 10% blending mandate on fuel in the country, resuming trade would mean a big uptick for business in the ethanol industry. China was one of our biggest consumers of uh, American ethanol. Uh, the exports that we had to China generally led the charts until the tariffs hit. And, and now our exports to China are next to nothing. So if projections show with them starting to initiate a 10% blend mandate also in China, that we could be exporting 2 billion gallons. That's a lot of ethanol that we could be exporting to China. So it could have a huge effect on our ethanol producers here in the state of Nebraska, on our farmers here in the state of Nebraska and across the nation. And actually, it could have a huge effect on every consumer in the state of Nebraska and across the nation because we all know, especially in Nebraska, as the farming community does better, the whole state does better. When you consider the production loss through the heavy-handed use of small refinery exemptions and weighed gallons of blending granted by the EPA on top of trade woes facing the ethanol industry, the arguments made by Governor Pete Ricketts and the ethanol board, these complaints begin to look like reasonable grievances toward the current administration's policies. And Troy, that's what I've got my eye on this week, and we'll send it back to you.